purpose of this seminar is to get you more engaged in understanding weather so that you aren't surprised in a bad way. So uh, while Hooper and Thomas are going to cover a lot of ground, you can't go from zero to 100 miles an hour on weather in one session. So hopefully, when you get these basics down and hear what these guys have got to say, it will give you a starting point so that you can go out and get further educated and involved on your own in looking at the weather. And that's kind of the idea with all these seminars. Not one seminar is going to go make you go from being a, a land lover to an ocean sailing guy. So it's going to take years of experience, but there's so much information that's out there either in books or on the internet that you can learn a, a tremendous amount of information. These are the starting points for going in those directions. So let me tell you a little bit about who's going to be uh, running the seminar tonight. First, Hooper Harris has learned a lot about the weather. He's been messing around with boats and sailing since childhood. But he's not only a sailor, he's also an airplane pilot, a helicopter and a glider pilot, a flight instructor, and he spent 25 years at the Federal Aviation Administration as a casualty inspector. Hooper has a few boats um, that he's had, starting with a Sunfish, and now he has a uh, Amity, which is a Tiana uh, 37 Pilot House Cut. Um, so Hooper's got a whole lot of weather experience, both as a sailor and as a pilot, and as a person involved with um, figuring out what went wrong. The other person who's going to be helping us tonight is Thomas Burns. Um, Thomas has had a 100 tons master's license for sale and power since 1993 and has served on oil field supply vessels. But he's also an experienced sailor. He not only sails locally, he delivers boats up and down the East Coast from Europe back to the States, has sailed in the Mediterranean, and so he is a sailor who's done all kinds of different sailing. He's an American Sailing Association sailing instructor and teaches sailing with his wife, Manette, who is here tonight. And you probably know from that Manette either from being around here or from her presentation a couple of months ago on onboard cooking, which was really good. So he and Manette raced with us on their CNC 35 Defiance. So please welcome Hooper and Thomas. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. Uh, as Skipper pointed out, uh, I have been uh, in boating and sailing for a good portion of my life since childhood. I would offer that uh, I've done the same thing over and over again poorly uh, through most of that career. Um, and in fact, um, I, I, I would look around this room and I can just tell you from having met some of you, uh, you have a lot more experience as a, as a sailor than I do. What I'm offering to you tonight is a little bit of a, a combination of my experience as a pilot as well as uh, my, my time as, uh, as a boater and a sailor. Uh, just a short little bit of introduction because I think most people don't know me. Uh, I'm married to Victoria Ricky. Um, let's see, we were married about right there, um, just shy of a year ago. Um, and we met largely uh, on the basis of the fact that I had purchased a Tiana 37 pilot house from uh, a, a, an individual who's selling uh, through uh, Welton Marine, and uh, Manette was the broker for that. So thank you for that, Manette. If it weren't for buying the uh, Gone with the Wind, now turned to, to Amity, I don't know that uh, Vicki and I would even uh, would, would even be in the same area code. Uh, it was my told I married a great boat. That's right. That's right. She married a great boat. Um, when we talk about, and this is a nice uh, photo taken by Manette, by the way, of us on our way over to the Madisonville cruise, which allowed me an opportunity to meet the folks at uh, Corinthian uh, Sailing Association and really ginned up my interest in, in continuing to work uh, uh, and, and to, to join the organization. Um, when we talk about having uh, been doing this since childhood, uh, that's me in the Turtle. Uh, the Turtle was uh, a single sheet of plywood boat that my father made. Uh, on a bayou uh, in uh, the Panhandle of Florida. It's my brother Chris at the bow and my uh, cousin Johnny at the uh, stern. Uh, we actually did have a mast, a two by four, and genuinely a bed sheet turned into a sail. It had a very short keel. Um, it, it, it basically moved under wind. However, you couldn't go upwind with it. Upwind involved getting out and waiting um, and, and, 
taking the boat. Uh, as mentioned, the previous uh, boats, uh, the Sunfish, which is a great way to learn, uh, and the Columbia Contender, a bulletproof uh, 1965 uh, boat, and then uh, 134, the, uh, the Chevrolet uh, station wagon of sailboats. What we're going to be covering tonight are really four areas. Uh, fundamentals of weather, global meteorology, talking about meteorology on a big scale, uh, macro scale, and then local meteorology, maybe even more thought of as, as micrometeorology. And then we're going to talk about some hazardous uh, weather conditions. Uh, the fundamentals of weather can be outrageously boring. So first off, this is going to be a, a bit of physics, but with no formulas and minimum numbers involved and a lot of pictures, okay? And we'll get through the fundamentals. It'll be, we'll have to work our way through that. But once we get those worked out, the rest of this all makes sense. And that's the key to it, is to get the fundamentals worked out and then hit right on into uh, the actual mechanics of the atmosphere. So, very first thing we want to talk about is, well, what is the atmosphere? Well, kind of like in the mall, you know, when you look at the big map and try to figure out where, where the stores are, you are here. We're at 30 degrees north latitude. We're on the surface of the Earth. The innermost portion of the atmosphere is called the troposphere. The troposphere is where all the weather is. There isn't any weather outside of the troposphere. End of discussion, okay? If you had a test and there was a question, that would be on it. All the weather is there. And the funny thing about the troposphere is, is that it's thin at the poles and it's thick at the equator. All the other components of the atmosphere are spherical. Now the reason for that is convection, because there's convection in the troposphere. There's movement of air related to heat. And again, it's thicker at the equator, thinner at the poles. That'll come up later. All weather is related to solar radiation, solar heating. If we didn't have the sun heating the earth, there wouldn't be any weather. There'd be climate. The atmosphere would have some temperature and have some humidity. But there wouldn't be any wind. There wouldn't be high pressure systems, low pressure systems, fronts, thunderstorms. All that stuff wouldn't exist. It's thermal heating and it's heating from the sun. Now, the sun heats the earth differently on a couple of bases. The first is seasons. Because the earth is tilted at a 23 and a half degree axis, as it goes around the sun, it kind of is like a rotisserie, okay? It heats different parts of the earth at different times. So for us, in these months, we call it the summer in the northern hemisphere, you know, May, June, July, August, okay? That's because we're exposed mostly to the sun because of the tilt of the, of the axis. At the very same time in the southern hemisphere, South Africa, Australia, Chile, places like that, it's their winter, okay? So there's a difference because of this axis change. That's the, that's the time of year uh, functionality of, uh, of, of, of the uh, variance in heat. But it also varies in, times, in terms of time of day. So in the diagram that you see on the far uh, right, you can see the sun in two different positions. One is overhead, where the radiation is concentrated per square foot, per square meter, per square mile, whatever it is, on the surface. But if you have an oblique angle, then the radiation is kind of spread out, and it's not as intense. And we know that. If we go out at noontime under the direct sun, it's kind of warm. We go out at 5 o'clock in the afternoon when the angle is fairly low, we're not getting as much heat from the sun when we do that. So the, the heat changes. It changes on terms of time of day. Obviously at night we don't have any direct solar radiation hitting us. It, it's hitting the other side of the earth. And it also varies by time of year. And it's that variable that is part of why we have such a dynamic atmosphere. It's continuously changing. We are literally on a spit rotating around and we're being pushed around, revolving around the sun, and we have an axis involved and we're getting different heat at different times. Not only that, the surface of the earth is different. Obviously we have water and we have land. 70% of the earth is covered with water and 30% is covered with land. So the difference is, is that water and land do different things with this radiant heat that comes from the sun. So the water is transparent. You can go 30 feet below the surface of the ocean and you'll see a temperature change associated with solar radiation. You can only go a couple of inches in the crust of the earth and get a change in temperature related to sunlight. 
if you go a couple of feet down, it's cold. There are people in some parts of the country who actually cool their air conditioning system is a bunch of pipes running about 20 feet below the ground where it's nice and cold. It's cold in a cavern, isn't it? Um, water is transparent, so it, it has a larger amount or a larger volume of, of material that can be heated by the sun, but it also circulates, so it can move the heat around. It actually it can store it for long periods of time. And what happens is water can absorb a lot of solar heat. And here's the key point. It absorbs it slowly and it releases it slowly. Land, on the other hand, is opaque and it's static. Yeah, it moves, but it moves in geological terms, in millions of years for some parts of it to move. So the truth of the matter is, for all our purposes, it doesn't move. And since it's opaque and it's static, only the shallow surface gets heated, and it doesn't absorb much solar heat, and whatever absorbs, abs uh, heat it absorbs, it absorbs it quickly and it releases it quickly. Okay? And those differences are not only in terms of an individual day, but also in terms of seasons. So, for example, you can go to San Francisco, which is surrounded by water on three sides, and, and by the way, connected up to the largest body of water in the world, the Pacific Ocean, and you discover that throughout the seasons, its temperature only varies about 30, maybe 35 degrees. If you've ever been to San Francisco, you go in the summer, you go in the winter, the weather's almost the same, it, okay? Go to a place like uh, Kansas City, Missouri, same latitude. It can be below zero Fahrenheit in the middle of the winter. It can be over 100 in the middle of the summer. They get wide swings, okay, because they're land. They're not surrounded by water. They don't have the effect of that uh, water holding heat. In terms of the surface temperature, the ocean typically has a temperature drop of about 2 degrees between day and night on any successive day-night cycle. A desert might be 70 degrees Fahrenheit difference. So that gives you a sense of the amount of heat that's being absorbed and released and how rapidly it's being, uh, it's occurring. So we're gonna cover three specific aspects of the atmosphere, actually four specific aspects of the atmosphere. We're gonna talk about density, we're gonna talk about stability, and uh, we're gonna talk about the effect of uh, moisture uh, in the atmosphere and, and, and how it reacts. Uh, three different kinds of, uh, three sources for density are going to be temperature, pressure, and moisture content. And then we're also going to be talking about the heat that is released and absorbed during the transition of water from a gas, as water vapor, to a liquid, as water droplets, and then to ice, as a solid. Water is the only component of the atmosphere that can be a gas, a liquid or a solid in the normal operating envelope of the atmosphere. If it's, if it's, if it's uh, dissolved into the atmosphere, into the air uh, as, as humidity, uh, water vapor is present as a gas, it's not visible. If it condenses out and becomes water droplets, it become, becomes visible. And then of course it can condense out, become water droplets and then freeze in the form of ice crystals or snow. Well, we're going to talk about a specific process called convection. <clears throat> convection will give us an opportunity to learn a lot about those things, about density and how temperature and pressure and, and, and moisture affect that, de that density, and the fourth item being the way that uh, the uh, uh, water vapor, as it transitions from vapor to water to, to solid, uh, what happens to heat. We're going to just go through this. and. Uh, um, Again, we'll hit a lot of the physics behind weather in this discussion, and, and again, we'll stay away from a whole, we'll, we'll, we'll not have any formulas, let's start with that. So, so convection is basically a, a story, and the story is that the sun <coughs> radiates heat. We know that it radi radiates heat down to the surface of the earth, and the surface of the earth then absorbs that heat. We know land absorbs it quickly, but doesn't absorb a lot, Water absorbs it slowly and absorbs a huge amount. As the surface of the earth is heated, it becomes warmer, obviously, and as it becomes warmer, it starts to radiate that heat to the surrounding nearby air, and then that air becomes warm. Now, warm air is lighter than cold air. It is less dense. It wants to rise. That's the deal, okay? So how come it just doesn't just jump off the ground? And the answer is, 
surface tension. So I've got a glass. This glass has some ice on the inside and some liquid. And uh, it's moist in this environment because we live in southern Louisiana, even in an air-conditioned room. And if you notice, there's condensation on the glass. Everybody understands this, right? You've, you've all seen this, right? Most of you have a glass. Why doesn't the moisture just run off this thing? It's because of surface tension. It's stuck to the side of the glass. Now, if I touch it and wiggle my finger on it, I can make a droplet and start a little rivulet. If I disrupt the surface tension, I can get it to start to drip. It didn't happen to do it, but you get the idea. You've all picked up a glass, put it down, and then discovered that it's running on the side of the glass, right? Okay. So the deal is there's surface tension that keeps this hot air, which is supposed to rise because it's less dense than the surrounding cold air up here above it because it's been heated by this condu uh, conduction from the, uh, from the surface of the earth. Uh, up to that uh, earlier, uh, up to that uh, nearby uh, uh, air, it takes some sort of disturbance. Mm -hmm. On the glass, I had to go touch it. It could be a disturbance as simple as a car going down a road. It could be the difference between a forest and, uh, say, a paved surface. It can be wind going around a tree. It can be anything that kind of disrupts equilibrium, kind of like me touching the side of the glass. When that happens, a bubble appears, and now we start seeing the air rise. So this bubble starts to rise off the ground, and when that happens, the wind will converge at that spot because nature abhors a vacuum. If we're taking a parcel of air out, something's got to go in to fill it, okay? And as, as that parcel of air rises, we're going to see this, uh, this movement in reality, what's happened is, is as that parcel of air is rising, the bubble is rising, it's actually a miniature low pressure system. And like every other low pressure system, air tries to fly toward it in the form of wind. That becomes important to us because when, a, when one of these bubbles lift off, we're going to get a gust that we, we didn't expect. We're out on the lake, we're thinking everything's going fine, the wind's blowing out of the south at 15 knots, and then all of a sudden, whoop, something from the east comes at 20 knots. Well, it may be because of a rising bubble of air through, through this convective process. Now, what's it, these are called thermals in the gliding world, and people who fly gliders fly in these bubbles because they're rising and you can fly in them and continue to climb. When the thermal rises off the ground, it actually forms a smoke ring appearance. Air is going up in the middle of the thermal and rolling off and, and turning outward and downward at the outer edge of the thermal. And, and this smoke ring effect uh, is, is fairly uniform. Uh, the, the, the ring of air, which is warmer than the surrounding air, because remember it was heated by the sun by contact with the, by being close to the ground. The, the ground radiated that, that solar radiation up into the air. The, 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 the disruption caused the thermal to lift off the ground, and now it's climbing. And so it simply climbs. Now, as it climbs, some things happen. And we start to learn some other items about, uh, about weather. As the convective event occurs, as the thermal rises, it cools. As it cools, it reaches a point where the temperature and dew point are the same. So we know what temperature is. Temperature is a measurement of, the, of how hot the atmosphere is or how hot the air is. When we hear on the weather that it's 98 degrees outside, we know what that means, right? The dew point is the temperature at which the water vapor in a parcel of air would condense out as visible moisture. Now think of it this way. We all know the term relative humidity, right? So we know that 25% relative humidity, the air is drier than 75% relative humidity, correct? Okay. So. The, the deal is, is that relative humidity is, a, is an expression that tells you the percentage of water vapor that could possibly be in air. When we're at 75% relative humidity, the air is holding 75% of the water vapor it possibly could. If we cool the air, the temperature and dew point will converge. As we cool the air, the relative humidity goes up. 
when the relative humidity reaches 100%, meaning that the air is saturated, that it can't carry any more water vapor, at that point, the temperature and dew point are the same. When the temperature and dew point are the same and there's any further lifting of this parcel of air, this thermal, what ends up happening is the water vapor condenses out. The water vapor goes from gas to liquid, microscopic little droplets. They're so microscopic, so small, they don't even fall. They just are suspended in the atmosphere and they form a cloud. Now, in convective weather, that cloud is called a cumulus cloud. Cumulus meaning heat or accumulated. It's the cloud that looks fluffy and looks like cotton candy, looks like cauliflower. It's that, 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 that rough-edged, billowing cloud that we'll talk about a little bit later. That's when the temperature and dew point reach zero separation, when they're the same. Any further lifting cools the thermal, more water starts to condense out. What happens when water condenses from gas to a liquid? It releases heat. Heat is released. It's as if the thermal gets a second boost. What ends up happening, think of it like a rocket, a three-stage rocket taking off. The first stage runs out, then the second stage cuts in. What happens when that thermal reaches the point where the temperature dew point spread is zero is it gets a new kick in the butt and it starts to rise even faster. As a glider pilot, I'll tell you, if you fly near the bottom of one of these clouds, the rate of climb increases dramatically within about 500 feet of it because water vapor is condensing and the train is leaving the station, okay? At some point, the thermal gets to a point where the temperature gets down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees centigrade, freezing. And now the water vapor that used to just be visible now starts to condense out and freeze as ice crystals. Well, what do you think happens when we go from, we went from gas to liquid, it released heat. What happens when you go from liquid to solid? You release heat again. The third <coughs> stage kicks in, bam, and the thermal gets a new lease on life and it continues to climb. So how high does the thermal go? There are a couple of things that, 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 that deal with that. One is the stability of the atmosphere. If the atmosphere has high, st high stability, the thermal will not go very high. It'll go up and then literally run out of, of force. It'll reach equilibrium very early. Well, what makes atmosphere the atmosphere stable? A stable atmosphere is one where there's a very low temperature drop with <coughs> altitude increase. Or in some cases, a temperature inversion where it actually is warmer as you go up. And that can happen because of greenhouse gases, pollutants. It can happen naturally with smoke from forest fires. It can happen from things like salt in the air, a very common problem in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's sometimes a temperature inversion around five or 6,000 feet. The key to this is, is that if the temperature continuously drops with altitude and drops rapidly with altitude, the thermal, the difference between the warm air in the thermal and the cold air in the atmosphere will continue to be significant and the thermal will continue to climb. Unstable air means lots of vertical development in cumulus clouds. Stable air means little vertical development. At some point, it'll run out of energy. Why does that happen? Well, it runs out of energy because as the thermal is rising, it too is cooling off. And at some point, it's gonna lose its energy. The other thing is, is it may run into a shear. It may run into a high wind level that actually shears the thermal and breaks it up. If you've ever seen a thunderstorm with an anvil sticking out of the top of it, what you're looking at is the top of that thunderstorm has been hit by a substantial uh, wind at altitude, at high altitude, and it literally shears off the top of this thunderstorm and shears the thermal and tears it apart. When that happened, it doesn't go up anymore. The final barrier to how high a thermal can go and how high convection can occur is the end of the troposphere, called the tropopause. It's the end of the troposphere and the beginning of the stratosphere. The stratosphere is an unusual part of the universe. The temperature in the stratosphere goes up as you get higher. It's a temperature inversion. Literally, everything is held under the stratosphere. All weather is held under the stratosphere in the troposphere. So what happens to this thermal when it gets to whatever its limitation is, when it runs out of, 
uh, enough instability, when it loses enough heat or it bumps into the tropopause, what happens then? Well, basically, it overshoots slightly and then starts to fall apart and falls toward the surface. As it falls toward the surface, this column of very cold air will start to make its way down to the ground. As it does so, it, to the surface, which could be the water, as it does so, it picks up velocity. So there's a lot of air, it's dense, and it's coming at you. Well, when it gets down to the ground, it just doesn't punch a hole in the ground or the water, it spreads out and creates a gust front. And that gust front is called a downburst. Now, how strong can a downburst be from a severe thunderstorm? 65 or 70 knots, maybe. And it will be an instantaneous change in wind. It will not be over a minute. It will not be over 30 seconds. It will literally be uh, winds 15, oh, the winds 70. It'll be instantaneous. Now, can you see it coming? You bet. There'll be, with that gust front, there'll be a whole bunch of water kicked up as the, as the gust front makes its way across. We are at the 40th anniversary of the loss of Pan Am 759 in Kenner, Louisiana, who, which made a takeoff uh, going uh, from uh, west to east on the long runway at New Orleans International uh, during a period of thunderstorms, and there was a downburst during the liftoff and initial climb out. And if you can't outrun it in the 727, you ain't running it out, out running it in a CNC 35, okay? So the deal is, it's a, it, it, it can be a, a big catastrophe in terms of a knockdown or an overpowering of your vessel. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll just leave it at that for right now. Um, so if we were to take a look at convection at the three stages, the, the, the uh, initially uh, updraft stage, the mature stage in the middle, and then the dissipating stage at the far right, what you see is air rushing toward the thermal and the cumulus cloud initially. Some air going up, some air going down, some going toward the cloud, some going away from the cloud, and then finally in the dissipating phase, everything's going away. So you could actually look at a cloud and get some sense of some localized movement. But the key for this whole discussion was to try to introduce the concept of convection, and but also to introduce the physical concepts of density, and we talk about density in terms of, for example, hotter air is less dense than cold air, lower pressure air is less dense than, than higher pressure air, and moist air is less dense than dry air. And we live in Louisiana, and I would bet 85% of the people that you talk to would tell you that moist air is denser than dry air. We always think about, you know, 95 degree day, 95% humidity, the air is thick. In reality, water vapor is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, right? H2O, two hydrogen, one oxygen uh, atom in the molecule. Hydrogen's the lightest thing on the periodic table. Air is made up primarily of nitrogen and oxygen. And they're what I would call the, uh, the light middleweights on the, on the periodic table. Well, when you have water vapor, which has a substantial constituency of literally the ultra featherweight on the, on the periodic table, any water vapor in the air actually makes the air less dense. So when you think about it, hot air rising, as it rises, the pressure decreases, the, the thermal actually gets a little bit bigger, becomes less dense even then, and then once the moisture level starts to increase, it even further reduces its density. All these work together. We talked about stability. Basically, stability is the reaction of the atmosphere when air is disturbed vertically. So if we have air going up a, a ridge, we don't have a lot of that going on in Louisiana, but if we have air going up a ridge, or if we have air being lifted like a thermal, in stable air, not much will happen. But in unstable air, it'll explode. It'll continue to climb, okay? So stability is really a function of temperature drop with altitude. And if the temperature drops rapidly, it's very unstable. There's little temperature drop, temperature drop that's neutrally stable, could be unstable, could be stable, depends on the uh, moisture content. And if it's a temperature rise, a temperature inversion, it's very stable and you'll end up with a very flat atmosphere. And you'll see flat clouds, things like stratus clouds, for example. We also talked a little bit about this business of heat transfer and when you change from gas to liquid to solid and vice versa. This little diagram shows this quite well. 
if you uh, have air conditioning, and everybody does, right? Your air conditioner works on the principle that we go from liquid freon and evaporate it rapidly and into a gas, and it makes the freon absorb heat. Okay, we like to sometimes think that the cold radiates out. It's not how it works. The heat goes toward uh, the cold. The point is, is that we utilize that evaporation in our uh, air conditioning system. Um, there is this other concept called sublimation. Sublimation is where the change happens so rapidly you don't even go through the liquid phase. We go directly from gas to solid, or we go directly from solid to gas. That, that, that occurs in, in some cases uh, at high altitudes. The key to this point is, is that water vapor, water as a liquid and water as a solid, as it changes form, does something with heat. And in the terms of convection, what happens is it releases heat and again gives that convective activity a kick in the butt. Now, okay, so we've covered convection and we've talked a little bit about things like density, and we talked about heat and water. Okay, now we're going to talk about kind of the big picture. The big picture is, is that the Earth has three bands of circulation and in each hemisphere, a total of six bands. And these bands are all driven by large scale, con scale convection. For example, at the equator, where we have a lot of exposure to solar radiation, right? Okay. We, we don't have the, uh, we have a, the, the sun is high and it's high for all of the year. What ends up happening is we end up with a lot of heating and a lot of rising of air. As the air rises, it's got to go somewhere. Some of it goes north, some of it goes south. The air that goes north, we'll just talk about that because we live up there. That air just makes its way north to about 30 degrees north latitude. By that point, it's cooled and it settles toward the surface. Well, it settles toward the surface, and where does it go? It goes to where the air rose. It comes back down. Now, as that air circulates in that band, and if you look at the band directly above it, we see the same sort of thing happening there, um, the, 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 as the, with, except inversely, it comes down, goes up, heats, and comes around again. This circulation convection uh, is driven by uh, the Earth's rotation uh, as well as the land-water configuration. It's large scale, and it tends to lend itself to creating um, more or less constant winds. And, of course, we take advantage of this in, in long-term sailing uh, operations, and we take advantage of it in flying as well uh, by, by trying to use the tailwind component to minimize uh, our time en route. Um, basically, what we end up with are what are commonly referred to as the trade routes or trade winds, which uh, operate at the, uh, near, the, near the equator, but not all the way where the doldrums are, where there's little movement of air. And then we have the prevailing westerlies up around 30 to 45 degrees north latitude. That exists both in the Atlantic and the Pacific. These winds are fairly consistent. However, they may be overcome by localized effects, such as uh, high pressure and low pressure systems, movements, fronts, and even localized effects like shoreline effects. We'll cover some of that as we move forward. But the key point is, is that the circulation is big time and it's all over the Earth. One thing that I can tell you about the atmosphere it is always trying to seek equilibrium and will never do it because the Earth is on a rotisserie. It's getting heated differently and the surface has different uh, re reactions to that heating. Because we end up with these three bands of, uh, of circulation, we have air mass structures that come out of those bands. And when I say come out, I mean they actually originate and then move through uh, as the Earth uh, circulates, as the, as the atmosphere circulates. The Arctic, polar, and tropical. Arctic is at the pole itself. Polar, kind of a misnomer, is really kind of this middle range, and the tropic is down near the surface, uh, near, near the equator, rather. excuse me. If you'll notice right here, we have the, uh, the bump of Africa, and we have this path that takes us to the Caribbean. If you'll notice, we have a maritime tropical. Maritime tropical, is it tells us that that, um, that, that air mass are, uh, originated in the tropics and, and in maritime that it originated over water. Maritime tropical masses are warm and moist. They travel with the prevailing winds from east to west. As they move across the Atlantic, the mid-Atlantic at that, what they, what they end up having is exposure to a lot of heat. 
We said that water releases heat slowly. It does, but it takes sometimes a week for this air to come across the Atlantic. So there's lots of opportunity for it to be, to, to be sucking up additional heat. As it sucks up additional heat, the air rises, and as it rises, it creates a low pressure system. That low pressure system intensifies, it becomes a tropical depression, it becomes a tropical storm, it becomes a hurricane. Our hurricanes are all maritime tropical air masses that start off the coast of Africa. Some of them are continental tropical air masses that start in the Sahara Desert, but they become maritime once they get exposed to that amount of uh, liquid, in the, that, that amount of moisture in the, in the ocean. We often hear about the China, or not China, but the, the Canadian Clipper coming down. Well, we often have uh, continental polar air masses that pick up such movement that they actually come forward and create a polar front. They create a cold front that moves down through the United States. And we see this as that sudden burst of cold air that we sometimes get in, in, this, in the wintertime. These air masses move around, change their position. We have some areas where the, uh, the, the, you know, we have a relatively consistent high pressure presence. The Bermuda High, for example, we often know that term. That term refer refers to a relatively consistent high pressure system that's related to, again, this mass circulation that goes on in the, in the atmosphere. Wind is simply movement of air. It is the atmosphere in motion. That's all it is. Wind is caused by differences in pressure. If I have two places and I have two different pressures, if the pressures are exactly the same, there won't be any wind between them. Okay? However, if there is a difference in the pressure, higher pressure here, lower pressure here, the wind will be moving from the high pressure to the low pressure. The higher the pressure differential, the higher the wind velocity. We have on uh, meteorological charts and weather charts things called isobars. Iso meaning constant, bar coming from the uh, concept of barometric pressure. Isobars are lines of equal barometric pressure. When those lines are far apart, the wind is light. When the lines get close together, the wind is stronger. You can look at a chart, and we will in just a little bit, and see those lines in their different sizes or different distances from each other, and actually have an intuitive sense of where the higher winds are and what might be happening to the wind in the future as, as weather movements occurs. Wind does not simply go from high pressure to low pressure in a straight line. There's this concept called the Coriolis effect. Now, I always blame the Coriolis effect for why the lines of my boat are tangled, okay? But in reality, it really affects more than anything else the wind. So what's going on? Well, the Earth is rotating on its axis. As it rotates, things in the atmosphere that are moving toward the, through the atmosphere, like the air mass, the winds, are, uh, end up getting deflected. And in the northern hemisphere, they're deflected to the right. Southern hemisphere deflected to the left. Now, I have to tell you, as a kid, when I was reading this stuff, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. And then suddenly, I just realized, just believe it and move on, okay? <laughs> northern hemisphere deflects to the right, lower, the southern hemisphere deflects to the left. At the equator, there's no deflection, okay? Because of this phenomenon of the Coriolis effect, high pressure air does not simply go from the middle of the high pressure system straight out. It deflects to the right in the northern hemisphere. In the case of low pressure systems, the air does not simply go from outside the low into the low system directly in a straight line, it deflects to the right. What results is a counter, a clockwise outward flow from high pressure systems and a counterclockwise inward flow in low pressure systems. Now, high pressure and low pressure systems don't exist should use the term, in a vacuum, they don't exist independent from each other. Ultimately, they connect up, and we see wind flow look like this. Out of the high, in a clockwise outward movement, into the low, in a counterclockwise inward motion. And the isobars, as I mentioned, the distance between the isobars gives us a sense of how fast the wind is blowing. Closer together, higher wind velocity, further apart, less. So now we've covered a bunch of material here. 
covered something about convection. We've covered some stuff about uh, uh, density. We've covered some stuff about water and how it functions uh, as it uh, becomes moves from water vapor to, to liquid water to solid. Uh, we've talked a little bit about high pressure and low pressure systems. We're going to talk now about clouds. Clouds are visible atmosphere. Normally, you know, the air is clear, right? We can't actually, in this room, for example, I couldn't tell you what's going on in the air of this room uh, back behind my neck. I can't, I can't tell you anything about that because I can't see it. But if I had a cloud that could tell me what was going on over there, I might better understand the system that's going on around me. Can you use clouds to make decisions? I think you can. I, I have to tell you, it's a data point, and it's one of many that you need to take into account. But take it into account. It's a gift. You get to see something that's invisible. It's not a bad deal, is it? Okay. So if we think about clouds, and we think about them as visible representations of what's going on in the atmosphere, there are three basic families of clouds. Now, there's a whole bunch of different kind of clouds, and they all have Latin names, and they're kind of complicated. But basically, if you get these three and the little qualifier worked out, you're about 85% through the program. Basically, the three types of clouds are a cirriform cloud, cumuliform cloud, and stratiform cloud. Now, a cirrus cloud, cirriform cloud, it's a high altitude cloud. It's made up of ice crystals, and it's got a wispy kind of uh, feathery sort of look. Some people call them mare's tails. They're beautiful, and they're high altitude, and they're very thin. You can usually see through them quite nicely. Uh, you can see a little bit of blue through them. Um, cirriform clouds exist primarily uh, several hundred miles away from a front. And they exist so far away from hazardous weather, and they typically exist in high pressure systems, they're great indicators of good weather. If you see a cirrus cloud, yeah, your, your life's pretty good, okay? Cumuliform clouds are, as I mentioned, talking about thermals and convection, is that heaped up cloud that looks like cotton candy or cauliflower. Cumuliform clouds, or cumulus clouds, uh, indicate vertical movement. Vertical movement indicates water condensation, production of ice, liberation of heat, a lot of movement of air vertically. You're not going to get movement of air vertically without getting something going on on the surface. Okay, either wind as the, as the vertical movement occurs going up, or wind as the vertical movement comes down. It's, it's gonna, there's going to be something going on there. Okay, if you see a cumulus cloud, Something's going on there that's worth paying attention to. Can a cumulus cloud develop rain? The answer to that is yes. We call that a cumulonimbus cloud because our qualifier, nimbus, simply means rain. Can you have a cirronimbus cloud? The answer to that is no. Cirrus clouds are made of ice. They don't, they don't create rain. Even if the ice were to melt, it's 20 or 30 or 40,000 feet up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to evaporate before it reaches the ground. Stratiform clouds are layered. They're like a blanket. They're stratus. They're, they're, they're a layer. Stratiform clouds don't involve vertical uh, development. Stratiform clouds may, however, involve rain. And when it's raining with stratiform clouds, it's classically related to a warm front, and it's classically widespread. Okay? It's also relatively benign. It's rain, and it'll reduce visibility, and you'll get wet if you're outside. You'll, you'll be dry in my boat. But uh, the deal is, is that it's classically not dangerous weather. So the three families, cirriform, cumuliform, stratiform, of those three, cumuliform clouds, cumulus clouds, and stratus clouds could involve rain. In terms of a cumulus cloud, we call it a cumulonimbus. In terms of a stratus cloud, we call it a nimbostratus. I don't know why. We'd have to take another lesson in Latin to work that one out. We can also think about clouds in terms of where they are in the atmosphere. Low clouds, high, mid clouds, and high clouds. Uh, high clouds are things like cirrus clouds, as I mentioned. Cirrus clouds can also pick up a little stratus appearance, or they can even pick up a little bit of a cumulus appearance and become what are called cirro, um, cirrocumulus. I'm not exactly sure how I make that go away. Does anybody know how to do that? That thing that's up at the top? Anyway, cirrostratus, uh, cumulus, uh, cirrocumulus, and cirrus clouds are high altitude. Mid-range, altostratus, altocumulus. Because we talk about stratus clouds typically being at lower altitudes, 
Alto simply means high, like altos in a choir. If we have a cloud with vertical development on the far right-hand side of the diagram, those clouds are things like towering cumulus clouds, TQs as they're sometimes called, and then cumulonimbus clouds, CBs. Cumulonimbus clouds are the clouds that also create or are thunderstorms. Now, does every cloud create, does every cumulus cloud create rain? And does every cumulus cloud become a thunderstorm? The answer to that is no. We'll talk about raindrop development. Although you get a lot of visible moisture in cumulus clouds, it actually takes a little bit of mechanism for that moisture to gather up enough to create droplets that actually fall to the earth. And even if it rains, it may not be so uh, dramatic in terms of the amount of energy involved that there's an electrical discharge that causes lightning and the associated thunder. So uh, a cumulonimbus cloud is essentially a cumulus cloud. A thunderstorm is essentially a cumulonimbus cloud on steroids that has created enough energy to have electrical uh, potentials within the storm, between the storm and the ground that create the lightning strike. And again, a cumulonimbus is simply a cumulus cloud that's kind of out, out, outstepped itself. Okay? There are about 45,000 thunderstorms per day in the world. And the southeast part of the United States is one of the highest thunderstorm-rich environments uh, in, the, in the world. So let's talk about fronts. The first front we're going to talk about is a cold front. Now, cold air is what? Denser or less dense than warm air? Which one? Denser. Denser, Denser. okay. So what happens with a cold front is this dense cold air is making its way across the surface and it, it is actually going under warm air. Now notice this very sharp angle here. Cold fronts have a very steep leading edge. And so the warm air that is being pushed up by the cold front gets pushed up at a steep angle. If that warm air is moist and unstable, it will be pushed up, moisture will condense out, the instability will create more vertical development, and you'll get a cumulonimbus or a thunderstorm. And you'll get a line of thunderstorms along this cold front. Ahead of the cold front, there's going to be air also making its way up. The only air going up is not just right here, it's going up all over the place, up in front of the uh, front. And it could be up to two, three, four hundred miles in front of the front that air is moving up. But it moves up slower the further forward of the front that you get. So well ahead of the front, you might get some cumulus clouds. You might get some towering cumulus clouds. And you might get, as you get closer to the front, some cumulus clouds with rain. But you'll start to see cumulus clouds in front of you uh, as, as the cold front approaches. They'll be scattered at first, then more prevalent, and then finally with rain and then a bunch of thunderstorms. Cold fronts are dependent upon how fast they move and how unstable and moist the warm air is as to how severe they are. For us, it's not an uncommon situation with the moist, unstable air in the Gulf. For us to have a cold front come down through Louisiana, get to the Gulf Coast, and kick up some hellacious thunderstorms. If the cold front has enough energy behind it, it'll push through literally in a couple of hours. However, the Gulf has enough heat in it and enough moisture that the front can come down and stop and become stagnant as a stationary front. We had that actually over the weekend. There was a stationary front around the Meridian, Mississippi area that was feeding an awful lot of warm, moist air up into that stationary front, the advancing cold front that got slowed down and ultimately uh, was creating a bunch of rain that, that actually reached out as far south as uh, the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. One of the things that can happen in a well-developed, fast-moving cold front is something called a squall line. Now, the simplest way to think of this is a squall line is a shock wave in front of a fast-moving cold front. That's the simplest way. Now, real meteorologists will say, <laughs> you overdid it there, kid. Uh, the answer is, for, for me to think about this, because I'm not a meteorologist, I think of it as a shock wave. And here's how it works. So we know this fast-moving cold front, steep angle, the squall line is based on warm, unstable, moist air. And what happens? We get thunderstorms along the leading edge of that cold front. As I mentioned, thunderstorms have air going up, 
And in the mature stage, you have air going up and air coming down, don't they? Okay? Well, the air that comes down comes down in the leading edge of the thunderstorm as it's moving forward. That air comes down and it's cold, dense air at high velocity, and it pushes down and it actually creates a new miniature cold front in front of the real cold front. Now, you won't see this on any chart, but basically it's a gust of cold air that's working its way forward to the cold front. As it works forward, it does what? Like every other cold front, it pushes under the moist, unstable air, and that air is pushed up and creates cumulus clouds that become towering cumulus clouds, and finally, they become their own thunderstorm. So literally, it is a thunderstorm that is created from the downdraft of another set of thunderstorms 50 miles behind it. When this occurs, you end up with a squall line shown on radar as a, as a linear line in front of the cold front. In extreme cases, we can get something called a derecho, which is a, a set of billowing lines on radar. And actually, what you have there is almost like a breakout of the thunderstorms coming forward uh, ahead of the, uh, the cold front. So you might be sitting there thinking, you know what? There's a cold front uh, that's coming through Alexandria this afternoon. Uh, we're in good shape. And we've got a lot of moist, uh, unstable air here. The front's moving pretty fast. And somehow or another, you saw in the forecast that there could be some chance of severe thunderstorms. You think, eh, yeah, but the front's in, in Alexandria. How can that affect me here in Mandeville? And then, sure enough, you might find yourself in the afternoon with a rolling set of squall lines making their way uh, from the, the northwest uh, coming down across the, uh, the lake. My most uh, terrifying aviation experience involved a training event in which I was doing some uh, pilot training as an instructor uh, as, uh, as an instructor down at Lakefront Airport. Um, and and the, you know, I won't tell the whole story, but he means it's a two-beer story. Um, that uh, we witnessed a gust front come across Lakefront Airport while I was in the traffic pattern with a student. The wind went from 15 knots to 64 knots instantaneously. I mean, okay, 15 seconds for the gust front to come across the airport. We attempted to outrun that squall line uh, in a Cessna 172 at 110 knots. Uh, we ended up getting far enough ahead of it to get to Gulfport and land uh, before, uh, again, we were overcome by the, uh, by the, uh, by the squall line uh, after we had touched down. Again, it's a two-gear story. Uh, but the point of this is you can't outrun this stuff, uh, and it's a big deal. So, so look for the symptoms of it. Fast moving cold front, moist unstable air, and the development of thunderstorms in advance of the cold front in a forecast. It's a good sense that there's going to be a squall line coming through. Warm fronts. So warm fronts are a different animal. And it's warm air that's advancing over cold air. Well, when this happens, the warm air actually rides up on top of the cold air and literally squishes it down. And you get with a much shallower angle to the frontal boundary. And, and, and the, the cold, I'm sorry, the warm front, unless this air is grossly unstable, hardly gets any vertical development. And you end up with nimbostratus, raining stratus clouds. Remember I said that raining stratus clouds, nimbostratus, could be widespread, could be a band 200, 250 miles across. And will that weather be dangerous? The answer is no. It'll be benign, but widespread. Uh, soaking, you bet. Will there be potential for flash flooding? Oh yeah, sure. If you're out on the water, then you're already in water, so it's okay. Um, one thing that you'll see is that the cloud structure will go from nimbostratus to altostratus, cirrostratus, and ultimately to cirrus, and this could actually occupy six or 700 miles uh, of, of distance. The, the other kind of front that uh, we talk about sometimes is an occluded front. An occluded front is a cold front that overruns a warm front. And as you can imagine, it's a mixture of everything. It's cumulonimbus thunderstorms at the cold front leading edge, and then you go into the warm front weather uh, beyond it. And again, this could uh, occupy uh, six or 700 miles of width. Um, uh, occluded fronts um, uh, primarily occur, um, uh, I would say, further north latitude than, than we see in Louisiana. And it's basically a cold front that, that literally overruns a warm front uh, emanating out of a low pressure system. 
I don't know if that was a very good indication of it, but we'll see a map of it a little bit later. The symbology that we use for, uh, for fronts, uh, I won't go through these, but in other great deal helmets say blue, red, blue for cold, red for warm front. Stationary front is simply any kind of front that stopped moving, cold or warm front. An included front, as I mentioned, is a cold front that overruns a, uh, a warm front. We can put all this together in something called the surface analysis chart or the prog chart. Now, what's the difference? The surface analysis chart is an analysis of the current weather. The prog charts are prognostic charts. They're the forecast charts. They're typically done at 12, um, 12 hour intervals out for, I think, three days and then I think once a day out for another five or something like that. I, I wish I knew that, but I don't offhand. The thing that you'll see here is, is that you can see low pressure systems with the L, high pressure systems with the H. You can see the isobars. You can see fronts in terms of a cold front here, for example, a warm front there. Um, if we were just to look at this chart, where do you think the highest wind is in the United States? Just as a general location. Northeast. Right. <laughs> The, uh, the highest wind is where the isobars are closest together. So Pacific Northwest and the Great Lakes are where the highest winds are. Um, look at where we are in uh, Louisiana. I'm going to do this without bumping any lines. We obviously know where that is. It's right there. Um, do we think that in this case we're looking at high wind conditions in southern Louisiana? No. No. The isobars are pretty far apart. What's the weather phenomenon directly to the north and west of New Orleans. High pressure. Okay, actually it's this cold little front. L right there. The low pressure system right there. Yeah. And there is a front, a cold front. Now, the cold front isn't shown as a stationary front. It's shown as a cold front. So it means it's moving. So what do you think is going to happen when the cold front moves through Lake Pontchartrain area? What's going to happen to the wind? Is it going to increase or decrease? Increase. How do you know that? Because it's pushing underneath the warm air. Warm air is going up. Okay, so there, there's going to be some weather associated with it. Some, some, uh, some, some probably some, uh, something along the lower lines of thunderstorms or at least heavy rainstorms. But notice the isobars are closer together on the back side of the front. So even when the front goes through and the rain all goes away, the winds are going to be stronger. So you can actually look at a surface analysis or a prog chart and get a sense of, well, you know, if that front comes through, I can expect the weather to get crappy because it's a cold front. I can also expect the wind to pick up. So, so that's, that's, that's pretty decent information. You can also get that by reading a text weather forecast, but isn't it kind of cool to look at the picture and figure it out yourself and then kind of verify it by reading it? So I have a question. Yes, sir. The, by the Louisiana of the L, yep. you, you have a blue line that turns into a red that turns back into a blue. What is that telling us? Okay, so let me, I'm going to ask you. I'm, so so okay. Louisiana at the top. Oh, Louisiana at the top. Okay, yeah, right there. Right there. Yeah. What's that telling us? Yeah, so so that actually um, is, is, that's a great point. That line right there uh, may have been stumped. I know that that's a front. I know that that's a front. I suspect that that's actually, um, because typically you end up with, with a, I, I know exactly what it is now. Hold on. This is a cold front coming here. This is a cold front emanating from this low. That's actually got to be a warm front that is so short that it doesn't have the symbology. I was thinking it might be an indication of a trough, but a trough is indicated by a dashed orange line. So the only red line that I would see on that um, it's not an isobar, because there's uh, 10, 18, and 10, 16. So my sense is, is that that's actually a small component of a warm front backing out of that low. And that will likely disappear. Um, and, but but this, this cold front right here is definitely related to that low. And you can see this other warm front here emanating out of the low. When that cold front comes and overrides that, it'll be an occluded front. Thank you for the question. I hadn't thought of that. Okay, um, anyway, the point of this is, is that if you understand the basics of high and low pressure systems, the symbology for fronts, and in some sense of what goes on in a cold front, what goes on in a warm front, understand that the isobars get closer together and that you have higher winds, you actually get a lot of data just by looking at the, at the chart. Okay.
And these are available National Weather Center? Yeah, you can get them. Uh, I happen to pick this one up off the Aviation Weather Center because that's one I'm more familiar with. There's also a Maritime Weather Center, and actually Thomas is going to give us a bunch of information about uh, weather uh, data sources. Okay. So, Hooper, what is a, a trough? A trough is an extended uh, low pressure system. It's basically an elongated low pressure system. We talk about troughs in the elongated low pressure systems, and ridges are uh, what are called our, our elongated high pressure systems. Uh, so again, a trough is just a low depression and a ridge, a high pressure, and it's when you have an elongated system. Any other questions? Okay. So that's a lot of macro meteorology, and it's good stuff. But we are actually affected a lot by local conditions. And, I, and I, um, we're, we're coming toward the end here, guys. Um, the most common thing that we see when we deal with uh, uh, a shoreline effect involving uh, sailing is uh, something called sea breeze effect. And this happens during the day. Air is heated over land, and it rises. It goes out over to the uh, water side settles and cools and then it moves toward land and we get a breeze that tends to blow toward uh, the land. The, the sea breeze effect uh, is uh, most apparent, uh, I would say, after 11 o'clock or so in the morning when you've actually had enough heating of the land that it's heated and released it. Okay, heated and released. If it just gets heated and doesn't release it, not much happens. So you have to wait for a little bit of circulation to start developing. Um, it probably gets to its peak at maybe around 3 or maybe 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it starts to decrease, starts to wane as the sun gets lower and you stop getting as much heating of the land. The opposite effect, I'm sorry, before we go into that, uh, when you have a sea breeze where you have this, this cold uh, uh, air making its way toward the uh, shore, you actually get a front. Uh, you won't see it on a chart, but it's, it literally is a little miniature cold front, like that cold front that came out of the thunderstorm that created the squall line. And you'll see a line of cumulus clouds. That line of cumulus clouds is literally showing you the edge of that sea breeze front. And where will those clouds be? They'll be on shore. They will not be offshore, because the heating is all going on on the shoreline side. When you have a sea breeze like this, what you end up happen, having is uh, the effect of the shape of the, uh, of the shoreline has an effect of diverging or converging the wind. And, and this can cause, you might say, well, you know, I went to that seminar and Harris said something about the, the air goes from the uh, sea goes toward the land. Uh, how come it goes north uh, here and east over there? And the answer is, take a look at the position of the shoreline. As the shoreline changes its shape, you'll tend to see some movement more perpendicular to the shore. Uh, it may be obstructed or may be, may be affected by the overall movement of a larger shore, but you will get some convergence or divergence depending upon whether it's a concave or a convex uh, shoreline. The key point here is, is that there'll be air moving from the water to the shore. That'll be worth knowing. And it's most effective when you're within, say, three to four, maybe five miles of the shoreline. You get much further out past that, you don't see so much of this effect. At night, you'll see the opposite effect, because the land will have released its heat and start to cool. The water retains the heat, and you'll actually start seeing air going up over water and coming down over land, and you'll see the wind shift around and start blowing out to sea. There is, uh, I used to do a lot of flight training out of Lakefront Airport. We'd fly over to Houston on uh, cross-country navigation exercises. Uh, there are two sets of airways that go from New Orleans to Houston. There's one that just goes straight to New Orleans to Lafayette, Lake Charles to Houston. And then there's a parallel route that's about 35, 40 miles further south. It goes Grand Isle, Sabine Pass, Galveston, and then up to Houston. If you were to fly the straight line path during the day in the summertime, you're going to get beat up by thunderstorms the whole way. Okay? You'll spend the entire trip deviating around thunderstorms. You're actually better off shoot down 35 miles south and fly offshore because during the day, 
there are no thunderstorms there. At night, you want to be over I-10. You want to be on the route that goes uh, New Orleans to Lafayette to Lake Charles. You want to be on that route because all the thunderstorms are going to be sitting offshore. And, and it, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's just, it, I mean, once you figure this out, not only do your passengers like you better, you get there faster because it takes a long time to go around all, all those storms. Um, anyway, the point is, is it's a reality. Um, you, you really will see this. And if you watch radar um, and pay attention to the Weather Channel and take a look at their uh, radar indications, you'll see thunderstorms blooming offshore at around 10, 30, 11, 12 midnight, just like you saw a thunderstorm start to bloom at 1 o'clock in the afternoon uh, over shore. Yes, sir? So would it be safe to say that when the breeze shifts from onshore, less heating, back to offshore, there's going to be a brief period where Absolutely. it's relatively equal? You bet. And there's nothing? Yeah, and you see that. Um, you know, just sitting out on the uh, in your in your slip, uh, wait till um, you know about sunset, and the wind pretty much dies down because this differential is no longer there. And unless there's a prevailing air mass wind, you know, from a front or or a pressure system, you're going to see this localized wind die off. Yeah, you bet. And the same is true for sunrise around sunrise. Absolutely. Okay. So the effect of this is, and unfortunately this screen's blocked at the top, uh, you'll see it in your handout, this is the lake effect. Basically you have, in a lake, it's basically water that's surrounded by land, so what happens is, is that you end up with these lines of cumulus clouds around the edge of the lake, because the air is moving outward toward the, the, the from the, the sea breeze effect, the breeze coming from the sea onto the land, and then it circulates with the cool air settling down in the middle of the lake, which again is another reason why unless you have air mass related wind, meaning like the, your, your position within a high or low pressure system, if you're in the middle of the lake in the middle of a high pressure system, in the middle of the day, you probably don't have much wind. And that's simply an artifact of the fact that the wind is actually all moving around the shore. This lake effect is really visible. I took a couple of photographs. This is a photograph uh, taken, if you're familiar, from the little gazebo out, out uh, at the inlet. Now, it's kind of hard to see, and I'll come around the corner here, but you can see the hump of the, uh, of the bridge, of the causeway. These clouds you're looking at are all on the other shore. They're 25, 30, 40 miles away. They're around reserve Laplace, looking in this direction. The deal is, there are no cumulus clouds. There's no rain clouds, no thunderstorms over the lake on this particular day. Why is that? Because all the air is moving out from the lake to the shore, creating the towering cumulus clouds. It's circulating back and falling in as cold air into the middle of the lake. And that circulation, that lake effect, creates a hole in the thunderstorms. And it's not uncommon to see, as we saw over the weekend, rain showers and thunderstorms making their way south related to that stationary front that was around the Meridian area, make their way south and they get to the lake and they're actually overcome by the sea breeze effect. They actually get broken up. They stop coming. Now, it's a heck of a, hell of a gamble to stand there and say, oh, I'm on the lake, that Harris guy, he said something about, yeah, the weather comes down and stop. The weather comes down and stop. Well, it ought to. <laughs> and it might. <laughs> so the answer to that is, none of this is perfect. But it's kind of good to have a sense of, yeah, I, I've watched this now for two or three hours, and the storms keep stopping before they get here. And we actually had a conversation with Annette and I did. And, and I made a decision that we would come back on Sunday no later than 4.30 because I wasn't sure that that stationary front was actually going to start creeping south. I did that on the basis of the fact that I didn't expect it to rain any earlier than 6 based on what was going on. And sure enough, during the day, the storms were getting further and further south. And sure enough, about 7 o'clock, we got a sprinkle. Uh, I, I live right on so the point is, you can, you, can, you can use this to kind of figure stuff out. 
And, and, and all I can tell you is be observant and kind of catalog these ideas in the back of your mind. And it might take a while, kind of like learning how to be a good racer. You probably won't figure it out the first time you do it. But it's kind of good to, to gather your arms around it. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, reading clouds. So some folks think reading clouds is kind of voodoo magic and doesn't have any value. Again, I will tell you, a cloud is visible atmosphere. When you see a cloud doing something, the atmosphere is doing that. Okay? It just happens to be doing it at a place that the water condensed out where the cloud is. The rest of the atmosphere in that local area, it's all doing the same thing or it's doing something related to that. Clouds have a life cycle, particularly cumulus clouds as they, as they rise and fall. We've talked about that. They drift with wind, so you can see movement of clouds as they, as they occur. You'll get a sense of the wind. Um, the shape of the cloud, the form of the cloud, what it's doing will tell you a lot about what's going on. Remember these three guys? The initial cloud top that comes up with the thermal, the mature cloud that has both updrafts and downdrafts, and then the dissipating cloud. I've put a couple of little marks underneath it. The base of the cloud will tell you what it's doing. If the cloud is growing, it will be concave at the bottom. But I'll tell you from real experience, flying a glider up near cloud base, you get inside an inverted bowl underneath these clouds. It's freaky as all get out. And by the way, the rate of climb gets really, really high. And if you don't do something serious about it, you'll end up in the cloud. When the cloud is mature, the cloud base is relatively flat. Now, it's not going to be perfectly flat. I wouldn't get out there with a with a plane and, you know. Yeah, OK, it's, it's flat-ish, fairly flat. When the cloud is dissipating, it's billowed out downward. It's convex, OK? It, it pooches out. As a matter of fact, when you have a lot of cumulus clouds deflating like this in, in a big aggregate, it's called cumulus mammatus. They appear to be as udders on a cow. They just, they all hang down. So again, the cloud base will tell the story. So I'm going to ask you to look at this picture. Now hopefully there's enough um, contrast. But I'm going to ask you just, here's right, here's left, here's center. Given those three descriptors, left, right, and center, is there any way to tell me where the growing cloud is? The one that's that's at the early stage of growth. The right, side. the right side. Sure, there's a little bit of a curve here, isn't there? Okay? We'll talk about the top of the cloud as well. What about a mature level? Center. Center. Hmm. And over here, you can see it kind of billowed out that actually there's some rain involved, isn't it? Heavy rain. That's a dissipating cloud. Now, this is all one row of clouds all on the edge of the shore, the, 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 the eastern shore and the northeastern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. These clouds are not over water. But as they are growing, they are sucking air in, and they're drawing air, creating a wind. As they are mature, they're creating wind both up and down, going both in and out of the cloud. And as they're dissipating, there's going to be a downdraft. If you're near this cloud in the water, you should expect wind to shift from a sea breeze, wind going from the water toward land, to either stop or even reverse as the gust front occurs. Now, if you're a racer or a cruiser, that should be important. You can look at the cloud and tell what's going to happen in the wind, if you're close to it. 25 miles away, it's not going to make any difference. Three miles away, you could. One mile away, uh-huh, it will. Okay. The other thing you look at are the tops of the clouds. So if we look over here, we see this kind of diffused appearance. That's a dissipating cloud. Over here we see, and I use the term cauliflower, it's sharp-edged, it's bumpy, it's gnarly looking. That's a growing cloud. Over here, eh, it's got a little bit of both, isn't it? Sure enough, that's a mature cloud. Anyway. 
That's how that works. So let's take another look at another picture. This doesn't show the bottom of the clouds. Where do you think the growing clouds are in this picture? All right, so All right. right. There are some clouds that are growing over here again. Take a look right there. You bet. There's something growing there. This stuff is almost stratus looking, isn't it? The clouds in the foreground have actually fallen apart. The clouds in the background are growing. Again, you can look at the top and get a real sense of the diffusion, the difference between that cloud and that one. This is a juvenile, and this is an old codger that's about ready to head to the home. Let's talk about some hazardous weather, and then we'll close it up. Fog is hazardous. Not for any reason other than it reduces your visibility and it leads to collisions and all sorts of issues. A common form of fog is advection fog involving maritime operations. And this is basically a warm, moist air that flows over a cold surface, typically water. Uh, the photograph involved here is uh, San Francisco Bay. It's classic, classic San Francisco weather. Foggy over the water because the water is really cold. The warm, moist air makes its way down the hills, uh, settles into the bay, and ultimately uh, thickens up as fog. Fog is a stratus cloud in contact with the ground. Easy definition. Advection, I'm sorry, radiation fog is a little bit different. Radiation fog is where the ground gives up its heat overnight, becomes cold, and fog starts to form at the surface. We see this a lot on the shoreline in Lake Pontchartrain. It's a very common thing at Lakefront Airport. It's nice and clear at 5 o'clock in the morning. Sun rises. There's a little bit of disturbance in the air that thickens the, 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 uh, the that, that moves the air up slightly. And that mixing cold, uh, cools the air and suddenly you get fog just a few minutes after sunrise. That fog stays there and actually thickens through about 10 o'clock in the morning and then it, quote, burns off in that the ground becomes warm enough that it starts to raise the temperature, and the temperature dew point spread starts to occur, and you no longer have visible moisture. So rain by itself is not hazardous, but it does reduce visibility. Um, and as I mentioned, not every cloud, uh, all clouds have uh, water droplets, but not all clouds create rain. These water droplets all have to bump into each other, and they have to bump into each other, and they have to coagulate into larger drops that ultimately start to fall. There's also the discussion of something called condensation nuclei. You actually have to have some dust or salt particles or something that the, that the water molecules uh, can, can gather around. In some cases, the, uh, a, a raindrop may actually have to move through a cloud, like in the lower right-hand picture, throughout the cloud, uh, picking up other droplets before it gets heavy enough to fall. So not every cloud creates rain. For rain to occur, you've got to have a lot of moisture, and it's got to have an opportunity to bump into each other. Uh, cumulus clouds do that quite well. Stratus clouds don't do it as well unless they're related to a front, like a warm front. A thunderstorm is, as I mentioned, a cumulus cloud on steroids. A cumulus cloud that has developed to start to create rain, and because it's called a thunderstorm, it creates lightning and the associated thunder. So what is lightning? Lightning is basically an electrical potential difference between the cloud and the ground. Lightning can go from cloud to cloud, it can go from ground to cloud, and it can go from cloud to ground. Uh, lightning is an obvious hazard, obviously. Um, it's associated with thunder. We, we can hear, they're called thunderstorms, not lightning storms, because you may not see the lightning but you likely will be able to hear the thunder. The thing with a thunderstorm is, is that it may involve so much energy that in the, the, the vertical cloud movement could actually go past whatever is the equilibrium level. When it runs out of energy, when it reaches a temperature inversion, or even reaches the tropopause, and it'll overshoot. And that amount of energy is huge. The amount of energy in the average thunderstorm is about 
half the energy of the Hiroshima nuclear bomb. It's huge. I mean, it's thousands, thousands of tons of water being moved at high velocity, uh, being lifted and moved seven miles up into the atmosphere. This is not easy stuff to get away with. And how long does a thunderstorm last? An air mass thunderstorm, one that is not related to a front. From this stage of initial cumulus cloud to dissipation. The answer to that is, is probably in the order of an hour to two hours. So while the nuclear blast in Hiroshima was instantaneous, this is that amount of energy spread out over a couple of hours. Um, one thing that happens with a large amount of cumulus cloud development is we start to block out the sun. And what ends up happening is we sometimes see, particularly in southern Louisiana, cycling of our convective process. We get a lot of convective activity, maybe around 11, 12 o'clock, some rain, maybe even a thunderstorm or two, and then it dissipates at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because we've blocked out the sun. Then at about 3.30 or 4, up pop some new ones. And we'll see that cycle perhaps twice or even sometimes three times during a day in the summertime. Again, this large downward movement of air is both the storm dissipating, the water actually entrains air and brings it down with it, and it creates these very strong gust fronts. How strong could that gust front be? It could be possibly up to 70 knots. Uh, now, in real life, what is it normally? You know, 25 or 30. But the point is, is that if you're near a dissipating thunderstorm, you will you need to be on the lookout for seeing the gust front coming toward you. You need to release your sails, unload the, the rigging, and be able to uh, to accept that, that sudden gust without a knockdown or damage to your boat. Last picture I'm going to show, and then I'm going to turn it over to Thomas, who will uh, carry us out to the rest, is a skull line. Um, if you see a squall line, or no one coming toward you, if you are at this point, that squall line is probably no more than three to five miles away, um, uh, you should have done everything that you needed to do about ten minutes ago. <laughs> that should include going to bare poles, getting the sails down, getting everything tied up, starting the motor, putting on your PFDs, and preparing to take the boat through a substantial wind gust. A squall line will pass through in about 20 minutes, but it will be 20 very exciting minutes. Okay, So again, the first scent that there's something coming toward you along the lines of a squall line, and you'll know that because you checked the weather and you knew there was an advancing cold front. If you know that that's actually happening, you need to be prepared to, one, possibly not sail that day, but secondly, if you are out, is to be prepared to look for this, and at the first sign, start taking action. And that's it for me. I wish I had less to tell you, but I didn't. <laughs> I'll now pass it over to Thomas. Where do you, where do you want to go? Just, just to hit the uh, okay. space bar. All right, just a, just a couple minutes here, and I want to go over there. Hooper did a great job going. I learned, I learned a lot. Uh, thank you so much, Hooper. My pleasure. Um, I'm not going to add anything to that. Just I'm going to go over just a couple of quick places where offshore we get weather. So it's not going to really. Some of the places I'll get weather here, um, but this is mostly for when I'm offshore, when we're sailing. Some other place when we're coming across the Atlantic, we can get some of this late, some of this information if we're a thousand miles from shore through an iridium go. But that doesn't really apply to us out here. But one of the things, one of my main sites that I use is called Luck Grib. And that's, this is, it's mainly for Apple devices. If you have an Apple, uh, Luck Grip is really good. Uh, and you can, I can, from this, I can zoom in on the Lake Pontchartrain. Um, I can set my parameters. I can download whatever I want. Um, the other side of it is, it has a routing um, component to it. And this is a route that I plugged in uh, from going from here to the Keys. And as we left uh, yesterday morning, and I think I have my vessel kind of about where we should be today, and it'll show how long we're gonna get there, what kind of conditions we would have expected along the way, when we should arrive, how long it's gonna take us there, uh, all those kind of things, and you can program into it um, your vessel, your polars, your tolerance for weather, your tolerance for waves, whatever you want. So this is 
not so much applicable throughout the lake, but if you're going um, just along the Gulf Coast, if you're going here to Pensacola even, or if you're going, um, it'll take you to the other side of the world. We use this, like I said, coming across the Atlantic, this is the one that we used a good bit. We use this one, which is Lup Grib is the name of it. Spell it, Thomas? L-U-C-K? L-U-C-K. L-U-C-K G-R-I-B. Grip. Okay. Um, and then, and it's, there's a, there's a free component to it that's pretty darn good, and you can have a subscription to it from other than that, but um, just from around here, the free part of it is pretty good. Um, the next one, this is um, Predict Win. That's it. Yeah. The predict Win is another one that we got, that we used. Uh, the other fellow on the boat used uh, Predict Win. I used Luck Grip. It also has a routing component into it. Uh, and this one also, you can um, select which weather models you would like. Um, and so that, that's, that's a pretty good. And it has some proprietary models to it that are pretty good as well. That is a compilation of those. Uh, the next one is just, this is just a, um, a weather information. This, is, this comes from Chris Parker is a fellow's name. He's a weather router that does a lot. Uh, all over the place, but his primary area of uh, knowledge, I think, is um, the Bahamas and crossing to the Bahamas, and this is something you might get from him, and it'll tell you what weather to expect, when's a good crossing date, um, and, you know, crossing times and what conditions to expect. Um, and then my last one, because I told you I was going to be brief, is Chris Parker's weather site, and this is where you would go, uh, so what do they call it, on top of that Marine Weather Center. Uh, and he's a sailor as well, so he understands a lot of weather routers are not sailors. He is, so he can, and you can go all the way from, you can get um, um, stuff from him on SSB, single side van. You can get emails from him. You can actually call him if you subscribe to that level of his service. Um, so, and, the, and I could go into, there's a lot more places to get weather, a lot of other places. You can go to the NOAA site and this and that, but um, this is something that um, there's, Tons of places out there. These are just the ones that I use and have worked well for me. And those are in the slides? Uh, yeah, I think that's in the handout in the slides. And um, if anything, if you need um, any information or I can help you on this or you want to talk a little bit, little bit further, please give me a call. Uh, or you can email us at the Sailing School, which is Louisiana Sailing School at gmail.com. Got it right. All right, good deal. That's all I have. Um, told you I'd keep it brief. I have one thing to add. Predict when. Okay. If you if you go to their website, mm -hmm. it's cheaper to do the subscription than if you do it through Android. Store. And it, it's also cheaper if you want to purchase an Iridium Go. True it's that. also cheaper to do it at their site as well. They have a really great, really great site. Um, you bet. I want to thank uh, Hooper and Thomas for this uh, excellent presentation about weather. To me, weather is one of the things that, um, that I'm most concerned about when I do offshore sailing because even if I've got the strongest boat and a good crew, the weather is the one thing that can just mess everything up. It can damage the boat, it can damage the people. So this gives us a good starting point for looking at weather. Hooper said something about making mistakes uh, when he was started sailing. I still well, make them. <laughs> well, we all still make them. And so for the, those people that are new to the sport, I want to encourage you to go out there on the water and make mistakes. You, I wish I could say that you will learn from everyone and you will never repeat any of them, but that's not going to happen. I repeat them all the same, but I just hope that my learn rate is greater than my forget rate. Uh, but like anything that you do in life, the more you get out and do it, the, um, the better you get at it. So. I encourage all of you who have watched seminars and are watching this one to go be active on the water. Uh, there are a lot of people around here that, are, that have a lot of knowledge about different areas of this sport. Make friends with them, ask them questions, and just get out and do it. So thank you very much, and thank everybody who uh, tuned in and listened tonight. Thank you.